Matthew 6 and 9. I just have a few points. I don't have a formal sermon, but I want to say a few things further about our Father which art in heaven. After this manner, therefore, pray ye, said Jesus in Matthew 6, 9, our Father which art in heaven. Now let me share these things that I had on my heart out of the morning sermon, or from since the morning sermon. Even though God as Father is spoken of by Jesus in the intimate personal sense, whereas the Old Testament and a close observation of especially the book of Mark shows, Jesus calling, now, what I'm trying to say here, I wrote this just before I came to church, but if you remember in the Old Testament, only six times is God referred to as, our, as Father, never as our Father. And in every case in the Old Testament, it's distant. In other words, there's such separation there. Of course, the blood of Christ had not been shed. And the, the precious Hebrew children had such, a, they had such a fear and reverence for God. We could do with more of it, you know, and I'll speak about that. Had such a fear and reverence for God, they never called Him Father. So He's always distant. And yet when Jesus came, He said to His disciples, When you pray, therefore, pray ye, our Father, which art in heaven. I watched my little daughter on the way tonight. She said, Daddy, what are you going to preach on tonight? I said, Honey, I'm going to make some comments further on our Father who art in heaven. She said, Where is that in the Bible? Now, I had the privilege and the joy of watching her. I said, Honey, it's the first book in the New Testament. She turned to that, found Matthew, and I said, It's the sixth chapter. She had never, up to this time, gone one, two, three. I said, Keep turning. What's the first one? She said, One. And that's page two, three. She got to five, and it was two or three pages. Five, five, five. She got to six. I said, now go down. See where it says Matthew 6? She did. I said, now start with her. She said, I can't find one. You know, a lot of your uh, Bibles, there's no one. They just start. So I said, well, that's all right. The first verse is there. Start looking for two. Two, three. Now, a child's mind can't jump to nine like you and me. They've got to do it in sections. Like counting, one, two, three. As we were driving, I saw her go seven, eight, nine. She got to the ninth verse. I said, honey, what's the first word? She said, after. And she read it to me. After this manner, therefore. She said, daddy, I didn't remember. It said, therefore. I said, it says, pray you. No, she says, that's not the word. So it's something else there. So I got to up and watched the road and looked. I said, it says, therefore. After this manner, therefore, pray ye. And then she said, our Father... And then she, she remembered faster than she read. Which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Back she went right on through it then. She knew what it said. But see, I had the joy of watching my little daughter look up her first scripture text tonight. Matthew 6 and Matthew 6, 9. Now, even though Jesus brings this intimate personal view, there's still a reverence, well, certainly and carefulness, and beauty, and graciousness, and discretion in his use of that word. For in the Gospel of Mark, he only speaks of God as Father only six times. And in all those cases, did he, did he refer to his Father in the presence of his disciples, not in the presence of anyone else. Jesus, the very Son of God. In his humanity, had such reverence for his father. Why did he do that? For one thing, he didn't cast his pearls before swine. That's what he'd been doing. They wouldn't appreciate it at all. Secondly, and that's not the one I had listed first, but the word father was so sacred that even he, the very son of God, was unusually reverent about using it. If you can get the idea that we're going to say daddy to our heavenly father, you've missed the point. If you think you can just say daddy at will, you've missed the point. The Holy Spirit does in our hearts say, oh, but father. But the meaning is of that of an intimate communion, close fellowship, loving relationship with God. Did not his holy presence come upon us as Jeannie sung tonight? Jesus loves me, this I know. 
For the Bible tells me so. And here we're talking about his love for orphans. And we have this wonderful poem. Wasn't there's a beautiful... Did we feel like getting up and kicking like, and like with a childish spirit? Or did we have a childlike reverence? Jesus was childlike. And he was reverent. And he was careful. Therefore pray ye, Our Father, which art in heaven... I do not want us to get earthly familiar, but lovingly acquainted with Him as our Father. Our Father, but oh, I'm so unworthy, which art in heaven. Our Father, but oh, the great privilege, and that touches my heart, of addressing Thee. Oh God, Thou art so far, but Thou art so close. Oh God, through Jesus, thou hast loved me. Jesus also was practicing discretion because it stirred the non-believing religious people so very much for him to refer to his father as if he really were his father. They didn't appreciate it. God is not an easygoing parent to be addressed carelessly. This God, whom we call Father, is the God whom we must approach with reverence and adoration and awe and wonder. God is our Father in heaven. And when we say our Father, we feel that love. But when we say which art in heaven, we must feel the holiness and the awe and the respect due his wonderful person, his wonderful name. I'll give you an example. <clears throat> Should we not be more reverent toward him than even the angels? All right, then why is it that when the angels appear, I think they appear about 366 times in scriptures, or at least they appear a number of times, why is it that people get frightened every time they appear? I mean believers. People that know God, why is it? And the angels have to say to them, fear not. Why? Because, brother, when the presence of God is manifested, there is a reverential fear that comes upon any person who truly knows what's taking place. So much so that even the devil may try to take advantage and the angels have to say, fear not. Fear not. See, I'm trying to bring us to a reverence for his name, not kick our way in in a childish manner, but enter in carefully in a childlike manner of appreciation. See, we don't know what this is like, but we want to become acquainted with it. Our Father, which art in heaven. In the book of Revelation, when the elders just stand, the, there they are in heaven with crowns on their head. They've traded their cross for a crown. They're happy and they're thrilled and the old crown's been placed on their head, but they can just stand so much of it. And after the glory, uh, after the glory comes so long, they throw their crowns down and fall down prostrate on heaven's floor. God helps them back up. They get back up in their seats. And after long, the glory of God becomes again so precious and so wonderful. And this is in heaven, folks. This is not like down here. But I'll tell you, the glory mounts up again. The pressure builds again. They take their crowns and they throw them down. And you know, heaven is one over and over again of elders getting up and down, throwing their crowns down, worshiping God, getting back in place, getting so thrilled to throw their crowns down. Now, that may not sound like a very interesting place to you, but it sounds pretty interesting to me. And let me tell you something. When you get up there near them, you may not stay up as long as they do. These elders that John saw. You may be real quick about getting the crown off your head, saying, I am not worthy. I am not worthy as the lamb that was slain from the foundation of the world. My, my, my. What a wonderful see, I just wanted to I wanted to use a scriptural reference to prove to you that I know of what I speak. I'm, a, I'm recognizing that our reverence, we do, we, we're do. You see, we're so glib about Jesus and so glib about the Father. We get on a joy-popping campaign and we just throw the terms without proper reverence. And I'm not talking about carnality or pseudo-reference or nominal Christianity that can't say our Father or get into the throne room when they need help. 
knowing that the blood of Christ protects us. I'm not talking about that at all. But I'm talking about a holy, reverential fear. And an awesome wonder that comes upon us to be in the presence of God Almighty. Now, he's been here with us tonight. God's been with us. I see, I got a little glimpse of His holiness and of His glory. That's how come He come up here and pray. Oh God, how long till the fire falls? How long till the baptism of the Holy Spirit? How long, Jesus? I say, well, Brother Hope, you've got a doctrinal background. You already claim that. Well, I have claimed it. God saved me and He's promised that He'd baptize me in the Holy Spirit. Now, I don't want anybody to misunderstand us. I'm not talking about uh, trying to get gifts. I believe in the gifts of the Holy Spirit. But what I need is a fire that takes every bit of the carnality out of my heart. Amen. That's what I need. I need the fire that puts love up as a banner in my soul to folks know that I belong to God. That's what I'm talking about. I need a fire that shows the evidence that I really belong to God and that all men would be convinced of it. Well, these are just points I wrote down. I'm having a pretty good time sharing them with you tonight. I mentioned this morning how important it is that these phrases be remembered together, spoken, remembered together. Though I separated last week and spoke of our Father, I am now putting them back together because they must be said together. The feeling, the response must be felt after you say the whole phrase. Our Father, which art in heaven. Knowing that the better translation is our Father in heaven, or the literal translation is Father of us, the one who is in heaven, the one in heaven, in the heavens. I know that. But oh, to get the response in our heart that God wants us to have. These two phrases together play side by side the love of God and the power represent the love of God and the power of God. Now listen to this. And the power of God, see, the love of God is in our Father, but the power of God is in which art in heaven. Now let's take them together. The love of God is always, the power of God is always motivated by His love. And so, if it wasn't, we'd be destroyed. If it weren't for His grace, we'd be destroyed because love comes from heaven, but wrath comes from heaven also upon the children of wrath, which by God's grace we are not if we have repented of our sins. Now these two phrases together reveal a caring God. See, I just marvel over the service. Reveal a caring God. Why was that so important 2,000 years ago? See, you folks have heard the gospel. So this may not mean as much to you, but I'm going to keep digging until it does. You know what the Stoics believe? They, they believed in apathy, apath apathia. And what they meant by that, they believe that God was indifferent to all things. They believe that the perfect supreme goodness was indifference. And if you wanted to get to the perfect state, just be indifferent. Not affected by bad, nor affected by good. And that God was just indifferent. There he was, up there in heaven, he just indifferent. Unaffected by anything. But Jesus said, therefore, pray ye, our Father, which art in heaven. That blew Stoicism to pieces. Because this God cares. This God cares. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish. He cares, but have everlasting life. This God cares. See, it meant quite a bit in those days. Because eventually it was to be the people in the Greco-Roman world who would believe the report. Be Gentiles like most of us. We've just had in this last year only two persons who could qualify as Jews. And boy, how thankful we are to have them. Our little Jewish friend, don't think she's here with us tonight, but she has been with us. And oh, she's blessed my heart. She's a, a real Jew. She really is. And she said that this is the first place she ever was where she was loved because she was a Jew. That's what she told me on this platform. She said, I'm rejected by Protestant churches everywhere. But she said, here, I'm loved because I am a Jew. Well, I said, why, well, certainly. Jesus was a Jew, you know. Did you know that? He was, when he was, a, he was a, a son of Abraham in the flesh as well as in the spirit. 
We're son of Abraham. We're sons of Abraham according to the Spirit. But he was a son of Abraham by flesh and by spirit, being a son of Mary and of Joseph. And if we love Jesus and the apostles, why not all the other Jews in the world? Now, folks, let me tell you something. The devil is not, N-O-T, the father of the Jews. The devil is the father of those who are in the flesh. The devil is the father of all hypocritical religious people. And let me tell you something. I find the same spirit in nominal Christianity that I find, I've been with Jewish people, or I've observed Jewish people who are as hard as nails. But most of the Jewish people I've met are not hard as nails. They're persecuted and beaten and hungry to be left alone and hungry for fellowship. You see, we've missed it. Boy, we get our ideologies and our doctrines, and first thing you know, we're, we're harder than any Jew's ever been. And the truth of the matter is, it's always been religious folk that rejected Christ. And they still do it today, everywhere, especially in religious hierarchy. It's always been that way. It's always been that way. The higher up you go in Christianity, the more the Son of God is rejected. I know this because men fear men more than they fear God. I know that men that walk with God are rejected by the, the higher you go in the religious hierarchy. I've seen it. I've seen it. I've felt it. And it's been my plea that men... And you know, somebody greater than I said this. His name was Augustus Herman Frankie, and he wrote, a, he wrote a little book called Nicodemus, A Study in the Fear of Man. And it was the book that John Wesley had in his hip pocket because John was going to experience this very thing. And in it he said that the greatest sin among religious hierarchy is the fear of man. And he said the higher up you go in religious hierarchy, the greater the fear. That is, when God gets to working, they'll not, they won't be willing to lose their office. They won't be willing to lose their money. They won't be willing to lose their privilege. And you see, we all fight that battle. We all have to give our, ourselves up in, in Christian things. We all make that decision to follow Christ right in the family of God. It happens all where. It's amazing to me that men can't see it. It's amazing to me that our enemies are in the household of faith, among our own kin. There's where the persecution comes. It's amazing to me that if you stand for Jesus, men will hate you. You know when Coach was with us the other night? Boy, I tell you, how thankful we are that he loves Jesus. How thankful we are to have he and his wife here with us tonight. But let me tell you something, folks. Someone told me Coach wasn't liked everywhere. And he may not know that. He may think he's liked everywhere. But there's places in this very valley in Christianity where he's not appreciated. That goes with it. There's persons that, there's people that think he's a fanatic. He's no fanatic. He's just a fan for Jesus. That's all. And as long as he can pray over that intercom, he's going to pray. And as long as he's got permissions, he's going to pray. Some folks think that's fanaticism. Some folks think because he witnesses wherever he can, that's fanaticism. He's far more interested in, in the kingdom of God than he is in, in coaching football, though that is his vocation here on earth. I know that. You know it after all these years. Otherwise, he would, have, he would have sold out to the world a long time ago. See, I know that. And that's why, that's why our kids are so encouraged at school. Because, boy, when somebody's for Jesus... They feel the loneliness of their rejection. And, and they need it too. And just like all of us were singing, nobody knows the trouble I've seen. Glory, hallelujah. Hallelujah. See, I've been trying to preach this for years. I've been trying to say, dear one, it'll be in the denominational world. It'll be in the religious organizations where, not, where your soul is weighed in the balance. It'll be the higher ups. It'll be the brothers and sisters. It'll be the committees. It'll be this and that and the other where your decisions are made for eternity. Whether you go for God or not, I've known it for years. And I've literally begged men to obey God rather than obey man. Literally begged them. And can't hardly get a hearing in anybody's ear. 
You don't have to be ugly and mean. All you got to do, just say, I want to stand for Jesus. And they'll say, they'll look at you and say, they'll say, well, now, if you're going to be in this organization, you're going to have to, you're going to have to separate yourself from somebody else. Why should I separate myself from anybody that loves Christ? Why should any organization demand that? When I was taught from a child, my father taught me that I as a Christian am to reach my hands in fellowship to every blood-washed one, no matter who he is. I don't care if he's even got a turnaround collar. Hmm. Glory! <laughs> it doesn't make any difference who he is or where he is. If he's a child of God, he's my brother, she's my sister, and I need them very much. I need their fellowship. That's why it's so wonderful to be with Ted and, and to be with Mickey, because you can feel the love. Glory be to God forevermore. And friends, wherever we find them that are for Jesus, we've got to stand for them in love and in carefulness and discretion, but very definitely stand for the men and women that belong to God. Let me tell you a little secret. God has not forsaken the Roman Catholic world. What are you going to do with 800 million Roman Catholics out there that haven't heard the gospel of Christ? I'll tell you what God's going to do. He's going to save some priests and some nuns and send them out there. That's what he's done because you and I will never be able to reach them. So they're reading their Bibles and they read just like we read that Jesus was sent for our sins and we confess our sins. They get out and they confess and they have, a, they have a saving work of God in their heart and God takes them clear over the countries and to the various places to tell the story of the saving power of Jesus. It touches my heart when I tell you. You see, I, I was taught a theology that everybody else was out but my own group. I was taught that. I couldn't accept it. That I was the bride of Christ and everybody else was a visitor. Let me tell you something, folks. As far as I'm concerned, I'm the visitor. Somebody else is the bride. But I'm, I'll tell you this much. I'm glad I got my foot in the door. It's been a mighty nice visit. It's been a great... See, I'm speaking to you about serious stuff. I didn't know I'd talk this way. But I'm telling you something, folks, that, made us, that your destiny may be determined in the days ahead. Brother, when I find somebody that loves God, I want to get my arms around him and go with them because they belong to me. That's part of the meaning of our Father. I don't care if he's Roman Catholic or he's Baptist or he's Methodist or he's Nazarene or Charismatic. Whoever he is, if he loves God, I want to get my arms in his and I want to be faithful and true to that brother and to that sister and have no other test of fellowship except the blood of Christ. Every man that's been washed in the blood of Christ is my brother. Every woman is my sister and they're your brothers and sisters and we've got to be together. I don't, you know... I was thinking just how wonderful time we had today. And Ted's very different about eschatology, the doctrine of final things, than I am. They're going to go have a sermon, a, me a message around here somewhere on prophecy. Well, with men of good spirit like Ted and Mickey, I could take some good sermons on prophecy, even if I have not been taught that the kingdom's literally going to come on earth. You see, I could get happy. I heard Jack Howells preach one time at Anderson Camp meeting. And I'm telling you, he, when he got into the book of Revelation, everything froze up <clears throat> when he got Jesus on the white horse. Because, see, we don't interpret it that way. We interpret uh, the church as the white horse. But, boy, when he got there, he got the master riding forth, got the blood slinging everywhere. And, brother, there's a battle in Armageddon. It got quiet. But I'll tell you, I got happy. I, <laughs> why? I'll tell you why. Because he was God's servant and he was anointed. I don't know that he was exactly right on his P's and Q's, but he sure was right in his spirit. And he had courage enough to preach it to us Church of God folk up there. Boy, I heard the, I heard the humps. <laughs> Brother, let me tell you something. If you love God Almighty, you'll never hump up on anybody. If you love God Almighty, you'll never hump up on anybody over anything. Brother, if they love God, you'll be happy with it. Say, well, I don't know about that, but I feel a good spirit. That's right. I know this person belongs to God. I remember when Mary Webster spoke at Camp Meeting, 1972. You were sitting there with me, Mother. Daddy, you were sitting there. Mary was just having a time. She's just a little old housewife saved for Jesus. She tells how God had helped her in her home, how wonderful it was to have God as her father and Jesus as her elder brother. She's just a preaching along. Somebody sitting in front of me said, Well, I wish we'd get a Church of God preacher. May God in heaven deliver me from that forever and forever and forever and forever and forever and forevermore. 
Listen, Mary was a Church of God preacher. Boy, God's called her all over this world as a little saint, little secretary of East Stanley Jones, and called her all over this world to walk with God. I tell you how wonderful it is. And when I find Mary, well, you've got a little message before we get out of here, I think, from Mary. Mary's written you folk how wonderful that little saint is. Now, folks, you stay with me. If God's going to help me like this, don't you run off and leave me. If you've got the same father I've got. Well, I could tell you about Epicureanism. They held that the supreme good, listen to this. <laughs> this sounds like Buddhism or something, but was complete calm, perfect serenity. So God, being the supreme good, was detached and unaffected by our life. That's very similar to Stoicism. Isn't that something? Uh, and, and then if you got in the perfect religious state, you were detached from life. So what you got is a God that's a deist. He just wound the whole thing up and took off. Oh, may God deliver me from that. When Jesus prayed, Our Father, which art in heaven, He was telling us about a different kind, a different kind of Father. A Father that was not indifferent, but a Father that cared. Well, I, I had this earlier in the message, but I, I had it here as point four. The sign that we are His children. Of course, we know we're His children because we're led by the Spirit. The Bible says that in Romans 8. But Jesus said that love would reveal that we are God's disciples. Now listen to this. But He was startling specific. These are words that I wrote a little while ago. When he said, now listen to this, love your enemies, bless them that curse you, do good to them that hate you, and pray for them which despitefully use you and persecute you. Then he said, that ye may be the children of your Father, which is in heaven. That's what he said. Shall I read it again? that ye may be the children of your Father which is in heaven. Love them which persecute you. Bless them that curse you. Do good to them that hate you. And pray for them which despitefully use you and persecute you, that ye may be the children of your Father which is in heaven. Well, the sign that you are children is how you respond to those who discriminate. And I've said it before in the old pulpit, we never discriminate against those who discriminate. We always go with open arms of love. I preach principle in the pulpit, and I, by God's grace, don't call any names or anything like that. But when I get out of, when I get out of the pulpit, then my principles, even my, the, the spirit that I preach principle in is over. I'm telling you, brother, it's, it, it's open arms of love. It's got to be. It's the only way to conquer. It's the only way in the world to deal with an enemy. One of these days, God will make it clear that love dwells in the hearts of His people. But see, He says right here that if you really are the children of your Father, you will bless them that curse you. You'll love your enemies. You'll do good to them that hate you. If you're really the children of heaven. For then He says, For He maketh His Son to rise on the evil and on the good, and sendeth rain on the just and the unjust. Do you want to go to heaven? I do. which art in heaven. I had a hunger. I had a hunger for it tonight. I had a hunger for its fullness. I had a hunger rekindled in my soul for its completeness. I had a hunger for it. Even now, the loneliness is severe. Why? Because any time a prophetic anointing comes upon a man, the carnal mind will resent and reject it. Oh, yeah. Any time. Stephen, most of your preaching has been rejected. Most of what you've done has been rejected because God uses him in a wonderful way. I tell you, it's a wonderful thing. But you know what Mama Newell and Dad Newell do when he get under the fire and under the glory? Mama start shouting and you've never seen her and Dad together. But when she shouts, she hits Dad's head. Dad be sitting there with his cane, have his cane out like that. And he was a kind of a large man. Mama, boy, Stephen being deep and the plowed being deep. Brother, he'd be making the way plain. And the hypocrites, their noses, they'd be flying under the red, white, and blue, you know. Turning red, then blue, then, then white, and all sorts of colors. Stephen would be preaching the gospel. Brother, making her plain because this boy's paid a price for where he is right now. And I'm telling you, well, ere long, mother begins shouting and patting Dad's head. 
He said, once upon a time, the glory hit Dad. Dad got up, got his cane, stuck it out at people and said, listen, don't you mess with this boy. You let him alone. You don't know anything until God gets a hold of him. And God's kept him quiet. In a community meeting not too many years ago, we had one of those 20-minute things, you know, where you sing a song, have a prayer, and you give a 10-minute speech. And you, you do that, you know, on the seven words of Christ. And well, our brothers and sisters, we're to worship and cooperate. But sometimes we don't know what to do if God doesn't contain everything in 20 minutes. Dave Anderson was preaching. Our Baptist pastor was preaching, preaching, I believe, on my God, my God. Why is thou forsaken me? And God gave him a 10-minute blaze of glory. Stephen said, Jeannie sung under the anointing, and David preached under the anointing, and masterpiece in 10 minutes. But the only thing wrong with the program was there wasn't any place for an altar call. Well, I'll tell you something. Mickey Wick made room for one today. You, you could have an altar call and join Winfield Baptist today. I thought it was wonderful. I said, Gee, now, Claire, if you hadn't called me to Scott Depot, I'd be joining Winfield Baptist today. <laughs> I said, I'd march right up there. A man like Ted Wall, I agreed with Mickey. I agreed with him. Why, he said, where else would you join? Didn't he? He meant it like a child. With a man like Ted Wall, why, uh, it's time to join Winfield Baptist. Boy, Mickey made room for it. See, well, you see, there wasn't any, there wasn't any uh, room for an altar call. And after, after he began preaching, a man uh, fell into the altar and commenced to weeping and crying. He, did, he was hungry for God. This church. Yeah, he, he was a man who used to attend here. And we, we didn't know him very well. He was a precious man. He was hungry for God. And God had fallen on brother over here and on Jeannie singing. And he hit the altar. But you could tell everybody was in trouble. They didn't know what to do with him. He, he was wailing. Weeping, yeah, he's wailing. Loudly, See, disturbing. folks don't know, what are you going to do when the Holy Ghost falls? What are you going to do, folks, when sin, when, when the old time spirit hits a place like they did in the days of Wesley, when men fall to their knees crying for God to forgive them? Oh, you better know what God's in, what He's not in. He'll want to know, you know what the test is. Wesley said it's not so much in the spiritual manifestation, it's what happens after the manifestation's over. It's how they walk after it's over. That's how Wesley could tell if God was in it. They said, that's the way I made it. Because, you know, he'd be preaching, and all of a sudden a pirate hit the place, and a hundred people or more would fall down, crying for God to forgive them. George Whitfield was a little, little more, a little concerned about it. He said, John, I think you're preaching too emotional. Now imagine George Whitfield telling John Wesley is too emotional. George was the emotional preacher. George was the great orator. Man, he's like the great Baptist of today. Preach like this fellow over here. One day I said, this fellow had an anointing of George, Whit uh, George Whitfield. That's what God witnessed. I'm telling you, those boys were under the fire. So John said, all right, George, you preach tomorrow night. You, you try it. So George, <laughs> he probably picked, you know, you must be born again or, or uh, something along that line. And man, the Holy Ghost hit. He started preaching away and directly the power hit the congregation. And boy, the people began to fall to their knees and cry out for God to forgive them. They were being slain in the spirit, right and left all over the place. The, me the meeting was over that day and George went to John and said, all right, John, I know it wasn't you now. God did that. Found out about that. Oh, what are we going to do when men are really filled with the Holy Ghost? Well, you see, Steve got down and prayed with that fella and tried to help him. And he saw that he created a disturbance. The man needed help from God. It's time for a prayer meeting. It's time, well, Mickey told us today, if we confess our sins, Jesus is faithful and just to forgive us our sin. He was calling on Christians. Which was right. That's who it's addressed to. So anybody, the Christian, the altar was open today for us to come and repent. And this man came and repented after he preached on, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? And of course, uh, one of the elders came and said, well, what's the matter with this fella? What's the matter with this fella? Folks, have any of you ever seen old time conviction? Have any of you ever seen people weep in an altar prayer? The old time Baptists did. The old time Methodists did. And let me tell you something, Presbyterians, even the Presbyterians did. They're the ones who started the camp meetings in the first place. Nazarenes know something about it. The old time Evangelicals know something about it. Brother, when God gets to working like that, well, Steve just left the man with the elder in charge and he got up and when he looked at the congregation, he saw that people were disturbed. Yeah. 
tried to usher him out. They grabbed him up and took him out. He needed prayer, not a takeout spirit. He needed a prayer spirit. And so Stephen looked at the congregation. What did you tell the congregation? He said, God got us. Listen, if God ever gets a hold of this boy in his community, you pray for him. You, you pray that God's got a hold of him. Jesus. Because, see, what did you say? Well, what happened was, see, when I saw that they ushered him out. Yeah, take the mic there. Yeah. They weren't supposed to usher him out. No, he needed prayer. And there was two of them on him down there. And when I saw them come over, it frightened me because I knew what they were going to do. And I I, I didn't quite know my place. Yeah, I right. was I didn't know what Because you weren't the elder in charge. No. Right. And so I just went back over and sort of took my seat. Yeah. And then I saw that they, they ushered him out. But all of a sudden, I was standing up. Now, I didn't know it. I didn't know I was Suddenly standing found up. himself standing up looking to congregation. I was just standing up looking at everybody, just like yeah. that. And didn't know. I, I, and I thought, oh, well, I'm up. I'm standing up. And so when I, when I realized that I was standing up looking at everybody, and here everybody was looking at me, and, I, and you know, I'm sure they were wondering what this fellow was doing up he there. He didn't even have a collar on no. at that meeting. So but they didn't then, know who, what so he then represented. I said... Uh, I said, uh, I said, folks, you know, I said, uh, uh, there's nothing wrong with this man. I said, I said, all in the world that's wrong with him, I said, is God's working with him. The Holy Spirit's dealing with him. I said, I'm going to tell you something. Now, I put th- th- my finger up like that and looked at him. I said, let me tell you something. I said, you just wait someday till the power of God hits this community. I said, you're all going to do it. Yeah. I said, there'll be a lot more doing it than him. I said, you're going to do it too. Yes, and then I, I sat down. And I got in my seat, and all of a sudden, I, I was up again, looking at them again. I didn't know I did it, Terry. I just up, I just out, right in the edge. And I said, oh, Jesus, help me here. So I got back, and I sat down like that, and whoop, I just right back up again. I was up three times, and couldn't. I didn't know I was doing it. I was up again. I said, now, Jesus. Now, that same spirit would hit the old-time Baptist ministers and Methodist ministers and, yes, and the old-time Nazarene ministers. And, brother, when God got on them, you couldn't keep them down. Right. Now, what are we going to do with this fellow? He's up in a community <laughs> meeting. We've already got reputation oh. enough without him jumping up and saying something well, unless God's really in it. Yeah. So here he is. He's right. up twice. All right. So what did you th- say the well, second time? The, well, the, well, I didn't say anything. I just sat down. Yes. I said, the first time I was up, I spoke to them. Yes. Well, then I popped back up. And then I realized I was out in the aisle again, so I went back and had a seat. Yeah. And then, oh, I tell you, I, it's like something had springs in me. And, oh, I just up, I just like that again the third time. And then I had to pray a little prayer inside. I said, yes, now, Jesus, Jesus. Now, now, listen, I said, Lord, we're already, we've already got enough problems. A good prayer. So oh, I, tell you, I, I know it, it. I know it's funny. It really is, but it wasn't funny to me. No, he, no sir, brother. Folks, he, I tell you what. Let folks, me tell you something. He's in a serious place, brother. What if God had landed on him? What if a prophetic spirit had landed on him? The mighty power of God, and he'd have walked those aisles and preached the old-fashioned gospel like men have never heard it in this valley before. What would have happened? See, that's, that's what. That's where he was. Yes, God, are you going to have me say something, yeah, or do that, I get out of yeah, here, or do I sit heart. down? I can't sit down. Yeah. What am I going to do? See, I was right there. I knew that I was. I knew that I was on. I had to make a choice. Yes, sir. Either I was going to have to run the aisles and preach to him and tell him to get right with God. And I don't know how many were right or how many weren't right. That was enough to me. I just knew what came upon me. Everyone was right, had a light on his face. Everyone that was not right had darkness on his face. Yes, sir. That's so, how you know. And so I said, now, Jesus, I don't want to ruin us in this community. I don't want to ruin I, I, what Pastor Hogue's done up here all these years and what you're trying to do. So I said, God, please help me. Get, let me get down or do something. Help me know what to do. So he helped me sit back down. And then the, they tried to take over right quick and had a little prayer. And I went right down the aisle and out the door. I left. Because I knew if I stayed, I'd probably have to preach. Okay. But he let me leave. Jesus let him get he out let there. me get out. We're thankful. Praise the Lord. Now, if you're in the kingdom, you've got this fellow as a brother. Some of you got him as an elder. See, this is old-fashioned stuff, folks. Our community's not known much about it. But I'm telling you, let me tell you something. If you think we've got enough, if you think we've got enough in this community, if you think we've got enough in this world, then why in the world is sin making progress and the church losing every day? We're going to have to have something greater. We're going to have to have a great awakening. An old time fire hit this place. Brother, I'm telling you, every kind of sin is on our doorstep and coming right through the church. If we're going to have help from God, brother, you better pray that a few Robert Sheffies and a few more George Whitfields show up. And that one of these days, God turns this boy loose. And don't sit on him with your spirit. Don't sit on him with your spirit either. But I'm telling you, folks, we need help. We're desperate in this place.
and pray for us that we'll always, well, do you want to go to heaven? Amen. Yeah, I do too. This is serious business. I'd like to get out of the responsibility, but I can't. <laughs> Oh, I told a story here about Uncle, Uncle Buddy Robinson preaching one day and a circus performer had gotten saved and all he knew to do when he got happy was turn cartwheels. And so when the glory hit him, he just turned cartwheels. Boy, he just turned cartwheels. Just turned cartwheels. Well, Uncle Buddy had seen a lot of things, but he had never seen Holy Ghost cartwheels in a meeting. And he wasn't sure whether it was in order or not. But he, enough, he knew enough to bide his time and not say anything. So he prayed one night. He said, now, God, you show me if this man's in divine order. I got to know where these cartwheels are Holy Ghost cartwheels or whether this man just happy getting in the flesh. So he said he was preaching along, preaching along real good. And the fellow got happy. He started turning the cartwheels. Man, the whole, he just turned him, and all of a sudden he did a thing and landed on Uncle Buddy's back. And when he did, when he hit Uncle Buddy, the glory hit Uncle Buddy, and Buddy ran all over the place preaching over the glory of God, just to holler into preaching. As long as that man was on his back, the glory was on him. When the man got off, the glory left. Hmm. I say, Brother Hogue, you're getting a little, a little far out there in your preaching. Now I'll tell you something, folks. I'll take you one step further, and then I'll try to tell you about heaven and quit. By the way, that is heaven. That's heaven coming on earth where we can tell it or not. What do you, before you judge a man, let me tell you, there was a great prophet of the Old Testament stripped his clothes and ran naked through the congregation. I'm not recommending that. I pray God it never happens to any of us. I don't believe God would work in that way in this day and time. But let me tell you something. You keep your carnal judgments to yourself. God's God and He'll do whatever He pleases and He'll do whatever's necessary to root sin out of this place. It's coming, folks. Righteousness is going to win, not the devil. God's going to win. I just thought I'd heap one on you. What are you going to do with Nehemiah when he got up and pulled the beard out of the elders because they wouldn't obey his voice? Got up there and literally plucked the beard out of them. Well, you want to be in divine order before you run up to the elders of the church and pluck their beard out. But you see, we got a whole lot less we're accused of. And people make their judgment by their own little ethics and their own little ideologies instead of finding out from God whether or not God's really in it or not. Hmm. You think Isaiah ought to come back? Nehemiah and some of the others? We'd find out what Holy Ghost preaching is like, folks. I don't know how in the world I ever got on this tonight. But God's helped, hadn't he? Let's see if I can finish on heaven. Heaven is the sphere where God lives. I just read these things off to you. I gathered them out of another man's writings, but I thought this is so good. I just talk to you about it and leave you encouraged because when you say our Father which art in heaven, you're saying quite a bit. Let's think about heaven a minute. Heaven is a place where we're set free from the assaults of the devil. That's enough right there to make a man turn Holy Ghost cartwheels. Heaven is a place when we will be released from the strain of separation. Heaven is a place when we shall be free from the tears of anguish, despair, and frustration. Heaven is a place where there's no more death. Heaven, in heaven there is total deliverance from the sorrow that is occasioned by regrets and remorse. And I've got my fill of it, regretting and remorsing. But in heaven it will be no more. Heaven is a place, John writes, where there's no crying in this wonderful realm. John says there's no crying there. And according to the Bible scholars, what John is saying, there is no crying in the sense of a soul hunger for God. That's what I was doing here a while ago. In heaven there won't be any more than that because we're fulfilled. I said, oh God, how long till you can satisfy this hunger for me to be like you? In heaven it's gone, man. Because when he appears we shall be like him. In heaven, we shall be delivered from all pain. There's people in this audience tonight that need a little touch of heaven. And God's got some of it for us before we ever get there. In heaven, there is no temple, no church building, no edifice or structure of any sort. Gone are the barriers, of the, and, and I think this represents the barriers of doctrinal division and things which divide God's people. No temple up there, no edifice up there. God himself is the temple. The Bible says there's no sun or moon because God's the light. There's, oh, I like this too. There's no night there. 
Boy, well, night can be an awful time. Night can be a wonderful time, but night can be an awful time. And there's no night of misunderstanding. You think of the pressure on me over God speaking through me like this night. Can you imagine to an audience of this size, how, how, how do you think I feel? When I've been taught certain carefulness and certain discretion and certain things, how do you think I feel? Well, right now I'm up in the glory. But when I get home, I'll say, oh, Jesus, could I have said it a little different? Could I have said it, could I have said it this way? Could I have said it, oh, God, help me? And there's such anguish of soul till sometimes it robs a man of nights and nights and nights of sleep. Not that he regrets of being used by God, but he doesn't want his humanity to push its way into the glory. You see, we all have to be concerned about that because a man get out of the glory and jump traces. But oh, I pray that God will keep us under His precious Spirit. No night of misunderstanding. The Apostle John says there will be no defilement. Nothing to connect, contaminate our thoughts nor mar our moral life. No deceit. No falsehood. No dishonesty. To sum it up, no sin. Then the writer of the Scriptures go on to say that heaven is a dimension of satisfaction, tranquility, and tranquility not known here. Heaven is a place of abounding life, absolute justice and fairness, where all work will be service for God alone, where the fellowship will be exquisite, and where every aspect of life will be fully revealed. And it is the realm of complete of victory. Where is heaven, Brother Ho? Jesus said, heaven is within us. Jesus said, the kingdom of God is within you. It begins here and now. And he defined it one place in John by saying that eternal life is to know the Father and His Son. Heaven begins right here. But it's only a foretaste of glory divine. The Holy Spirit is our guarantee of a greater inheritance. And of course, I've been speaking for the most part of the greater inheritance. And yet, my dear ones, we've had a little bit of heaven to go to heaven in this very night. We've had God's gracious leading. We've had God's gracious spirit. We've had God's gracious leading. His leading, Stephen. You and I could never have arranged. Dad, David, Richardson's, Doss. Brother Richardson and his, wife, and his sister Kathy, Kathy Doss, and, and, and gentlemen, lay minister, and uh, Rodney, we couldn't have arranged this. I've been so amazed at it, I've just hardly known what to do. But just simply say, oh God, let a little heaven fall on my soul and get me there by the blood of Jesus Christ.